After Hamas brutally attacks Israel, 1.1 million Palestinians are told to evacuate their homes. But what happens to the Palestinian Christians? Will the last Christians finally be driven out of the land of Christ's birth? Meanwhile, Jewish voices cry out in defense of the Palestinians. Plus, the Synod on Synodality has a new pitch man. Whoopi Goldberg thanks Pope Francis on behalf of her gay friends and explains why the Latin Mass has to go. And finally, all hail to the chief, the Karens of the world lose around. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Matt. This is the Remnant Underground. We are going to go where angels fear to tread tonight. We're going to talk Israel and the Gaza Strip in just a moment. So who knows? Maybe that'll get us taken down off YouTube once and for all. I don't know. But anyway, I mean, you know, if you want the Amen Chorus, there's plenty of places to get that. Not going to get that here. We're going to actually get serious about that topic. But before we get into that, we have some really, really good news. The Chief is back. After having stood down on Main Street, Osceola, Wisconsin, for decades to the delight of children and families everywhere, the chief was removed by a gaggle of Karens recently who decided that a statue of a Native American chief was deeply offensive to Native Americans. Go figure. So the statue came down, but something wonderful happened. Some sane people got involved with the debate, including now my own daughter-in-law here, and my granddaughter, uh, they went down to the town hall there, to the council, and told them that maybe it was time for Karen to grow up. What do you know, it worked that very night. The chief was restored to his place of honor on Main Street. And from what I understand, Karen left the building, her mask covering her mouth and her nose as she departed in haste. The moral of the story, Karen is an idiot. Speaking of Karen, poor Francis. He's at it again. I'm going to try, I'm going to try to stay calm because this is getting out of control. Is it not out of control, this guy? <clears throat> it's just getting worse by the second. He just promoted his pal, Father Tony Spadaro here, to a curial position, which is kind of funny since Father Tony just preached a sermon in which he described Jesus. Now get this, <laughs> this Jesuit described Jesus as indifferent, uncaring, angry and insensitive, unbreakably hard, mocking and disrespectful, and most importantly, he was blinded, Jesus was, by nationalism and theological rigor. So says Father Tony. But the Canaanite woman, Father Tony goes on to say, no doubt imbued with the spirit of synodality, she persisted, and according to Father Tony, she eventually upset the rigidity of Jesus, who in the end shows himself free from the rigidity of the dominant theological, political, and cultural elements of his time. Uh, and he healed the Canaanite's daughter. So says Father Tony. Now, they're just playing with us, right? This is blasphemy. So to hell with Father Tony Spadaro, of course. No. Father Tony Spadaro just got himself a brand new spanking promotion by Pope Francis who has himself now confused <laughs> for a superhero weatherman who's gonna save the planet. With the global gathering of Catholic bishops as a backdrop, Pope Francis warned the world is approaching the point of no return on climate. Amen. Published in a booklet, the pontiff's most forceful intervention yet in the climate crisis. Our responses have not been adequate, he wrote, while the world is collapsing and may be near the breaking point. He urged decisive acceleration to renewable energies and away from oil and gas. The, the absurdity of this is out of control. Team Francis, right now, right now, as the Mideast blows up, Holy Land blows up, as all the Christians leave the Holy Land, <laughs> I was talking about that, Pope Francis is addressing the other great crisis of our time. Well. Aging Karens who don't feel comfortable or welcome in the church. How do we get people to come in and feel like, I love this place. I feel warm and welcome here. Mm -hmm. I want to be here. There's people here that I know and love. There are things to share with these people. I will listen to them. I will talk to them. 
I I can I can share my feelings here. I can go home feeling like, wow, that was fantastic. Now that kind of talk is going on all over in Rome right now. They're actually taking it seriously. And it's really hard to see because they all sound like Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live. It's, it's incredible that they, they're missing that, how much they sound like, and I'm worth it. And here I am to say today that I want to be recognized because I'm worth it, right? I mean, they sound just like comic caricatures, comic characters from late night TV. I deserve good things. I am entitled to my share of happiness. I refuse to beat myself up. And Rome is taking it seriously, or so they're saying. See, I don't actually think they are. This is just a game. The entire synod on synodality is all about sodomy, friends. You know that, right? Everything else is window dressing. Everything else is pause and slow and do this and do that and make a lot of words, don't say anything. Getting prepared to green light sodomy. Why? Because of the Great Reset. Equity and inclusion, remember? You can't have one church that's standing out and st higher than and taller than all the rest, doing the will of God, obeying the Ten Commandments, being exclusive of those who refuse to obey the Ten Commandments. You can't have that church. And the one commandment left that the Catholic Church still, in her human element, still is opposed to, at least on paper, is the sixth one, which has to do with sodomy. We got to get rid of that so that the Catholic Church will not be exceptional. We will not. They will not tolerate religious supremacism. And that's what that is. So that's what this is all about. So now you're listening to these, these people, these people who, you know, for whatever reason, either because they're not intellectually gifted or they're challenged, verbally challenged on some lo level, low IQ, whatever it is, they want to talk about the fact that they're not accepted at church and you'd like to feel more welcome. And that's going to determine the future of the greatest church in the history of the world, greatest religion in the history of the world, one founded by Jesus Christ, some series, some gaggle of idiots who know absolutely nothing about the law of God or the church's law or the Ten Commandments, but they want to make, make me feel welcome. You see how stupid it is? You see how urgent it is that we speak out against this? The synod on synodality over in Rome, it couldn't possibly matter less. Greetings from just outside St. Peter's Basilica, whose bells you can hear, and right behind me, the Synod Hall. And what about people that do not yet feel welcome, though baptized, they don't feel welcome in the Eucharistic assemblies? And how can we witness to a divided world the great freedom and joy that we have in Christ Jesus? It was a good week. It wasn't an easy week. And things got a little more complicated today because we began the next priority for synodality. You remember we started with communion, and now we're looking at mission. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> Cardinal Nighty Knight Tobin. Nobody cares, eminence. By the way, Cardinal Nighty Knight. <laughs> just tweeted this out this morning. He says, the church is not afraid. No, I'm going to use my synodal voice. The church is not afraid of the variety it bears, but values it without forcing it into uniformity. The synodal process is an opportunity to learn what it means to live unity and diversity Trusting that the path will become clearer as we move forward. That's what they're doing. That's what they're, they're, they're making that voice up. They're making these words up. They're stripping the meaning from the words. They're not actually saying anything because that's sort of demonic too, isn't it? When you have supposedly educated theologians just word vomiting all over the place and expecting us to take notes with our Crayolas because something important is going on. Nothing important is going on. They're simply dismantling the church with stupidity. And this particular tweet from, Father, from Cardinal Nighty Knight <laughs> prompted Damian Thompson to observe, you could reorganize these words at random and they'd make just as much sense. 
which, by the way, uh, could be said of the entire synodal process. It's all Barbara Streisand, friends. It truly is. With an end game, which we're going to see not this year, now, no, this is just softening. This is just putting everyone to sleep with stupid. It's all going to happen in 2024. That synod is the one where you're going to see the issues voted on, right? Now the issue is, shall we be incredibly stupid or not? And they're all going to vote. Yeah, let's just be really stupid for now. So more on the synod in a moment, but first to tonight's uh, sponsor, which is Charity Mobile. Some sane people uh, in the world. America's pro-life phone company is Charity Mobile. So if you switch your plan today, you got no contracts, you get a free phone, in fact, and you enjoy the satisfaction of knowing that 5% of what you pay for your service goes to the pro-life charity of your choice. Do me a favor, visit charitymobile.com today, use the promo code REMNANTTV, and let's support the most pro-life phone company in America. That's charitymobile.com. Okay. Okay, okay. So here we go. Yeah, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I'm sorry, but you know, we get such great feedback from you guys, people all over the world, Catholics, non-Catholics, uh, telling us you get the fear, you're, you're, you're not afraid, you say it like it is. Okay, fine, that's beautiful, thank you for that. But it's times like these, I think, where you have to sort of decide, are you going to actually try to provide some some leadership or some insight or at least a discussion that's going to help people or not. So I know what the prevailing wisdom is right now. The, the, the war drums are rattling again, right? Don't say anything. Don't get involved because people are going to come after you, because people's emotions are through the roof, because people have seen dead babies again. People have seen dead party goers again. They're watching the TV and they're seeing horrible things and they're saying, well, whoever did this needs to die right now. We're doing it once again. So I'm, I, I respect you, this audience, enough to just more or less assume that you want to talk, you want to get serious about what's really happening here. And I'm not an expert. I don't plan, I don't pose as an expert on the Middle East. But we've been watching this situation for an awful long time, right? It's not like, it's not even like Ukraine. <laughs> the thing happened in Ukraine, everybody's like, ooh, Fiddler on the Roof, Anna Tefka, there are cows and gravel roads getting bombed by those evil Russians. I get that. We didn't know. But in this situation, in the Middle East, we all grew up with this. This has been going on forever. So please don't use October 7th, 2023 as the thing that makes you decide where you're going to come down on this, because this is huge and it could lead to world war, right? Obviously, much more easily could this lead to world war than the Ukrainian situation. Europe didn't seem too willing. Even Poland's backed out, right? And uh, this one, this one, this one's different, you know? So again, things didn't work out in Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky is done, let's face it. Putin is beginning to look like a genius, right? Things didn't work out and it's time for a backup plan for these neocons, Republicans and Democrats. I hope people have been watching this show long enough to know <laughs> that the difference between the two parties is pretty, pretty slim, right? So Republicans and Democrats are behind this thing. And this fool, Joe Biden, now he wants us. He wants us with you and me. <laughs> to give $74 billion to support the continued slaughter of civilians in Ukraine. That's been going on since 2014, right? And also now to begin to finance Israel's, what, what many, including the United Nations, are calling ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Is everybody okay with that? Are you okay with that? Because you know what you're listening to, right? The talking heads on TV, they tell us that it's our patriotic duty to get behind this. These are the same folks, the same talking heads that told us just a few couple years ago to trust the science, to get the thing, mask up, remember? And now we're all like, ha, 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 we'll never fall for that again. But hold on a second, I want to change my avatar to an Israeli flag because they told you to on TV. No, no, I get it. Hamas attacked and killed innocent people, civilians. Anybody who does that should pay. But does justice for that mean that you and I have to back retaliatory war crimes against two million Palestinians, half of whom are children? Israel just ordered 1.1 million residents of Gaza to evacuate their homes and move to the south. 
And this was considered humanitarian. Well, they're warning them. They're getting them out. The Palestinians are getting a warning. <laughs> Imagine if you got that warning tonight. You have 24 hours to move to Tallahassee because we're going to bomb the hell out of your homeland. <sighs> move south. Half of these Palestinians we're talking about are children and teens. And they've been living in abject poverty forever, all of their lives. Just move south. Get out of here because of Hamas. How are these Palestinians supposed to move away from them? <laughs> Where are they supposed to go, these kids and these teenagers? <laughs> and while they try to figure out how to move 1.1 million people to the south, bombs are falling all over, the, all over the Gaza Strip. One just struck a Christian hospital, the Al-Ahali Hospital in Gaza. Now when the bombing started, heartbreakingly enough, Muslims and Christians began to take shelter at this hospital because it's a Christian hospital and they thought it would be safe. Do you know why else they wanted to go meet there and, and hide there and try to stay safe there? It was because in the courtyard of this Christian hospital, there's a water fountain. And they don't have any water in Gaza right now. The water's been turned off, you know? So they meet at this hospital. And then reportedly the bombs hit that exact courtyard. And this morning I saw a figure 877 Christians and Muslims are dead. He said, well, they had it coming because, you know, Hamas uses them as human, human shields and, and they, you know. Now the mainstream media, they said that the Palestinians bombed their own hospital. But families on the ground say it was Israel. Now I want to, I got a question for you. Do, do you know who did it? Were you there? You got some footage maybe? Who did it? I don't know who did it. You don't know who did it. But maybe there's one thing we can all agree on. Israel is a most, the most powerful s surveillance state in the world right now. The whole country is under constant surveillance, partly because they've got terrorist problems and everything else. I'm not describing blame. I'm just saying that's the reality. Israel monitors every single email, every single email in Gaza. Palestine, everyone, every IM, every text, and they all know it. They all know it. So what I would say is rather than speculating as to who is responsible for bombing hospitals and churches and kids over there, I would say surely we can agree that there's a better way of taking out Hamas than the evacuation of two million innocent people and bombing hospitals. And if this puts me on the side of AOC, so be it. You, my critics, are on the side of Joy Behar. Who cares? What difference does it make? Don't let the media polarize us here. Let's be done with the guilt by association. And let's use our heads and let's use our Christian consciences here. Because we learned something during COVID, didn't we? We learned not to trust the TV. At least we learned that much. And what are they saying on TV right now? What are they telling us? They're telling us that we need to hate, you and I. We need to hate the people they tell us on TV to hate. And if we don't, then we're the haters. Well, that's how Holocausts happen. You start talking about scorching earth and getting rid of entire communities. That's how Holocausts happen. Did, did we learn absolutely nothing? You see, because I don't hate on command. Do you? Do you hate people because the guy on TV told you to? Showed you some pictures of dead babies and then said, okay, now hate them for this. And you're like, well, yeah, in this case, I guess the TV is telling me the truth. I got the goods, man. I know exactly what's going on there. Sorry, friends. My, my, my conscience won't allow me to do that, nor, nor will my conscience allow me to support Lindsey Graham's ethnic cleansing plan. We're in a religious yeah. war here. I am with Israel. Do whatever the hell you have to do to defend yourself. Level the place. That's right, Lindsay. Let's, uh, let's level the place. And maybe whoever survives our leveling, we can put them on cattle cars, right? Get them onto a camp somewhere. By the way, isn't Lindsey Graham the same clown who promised Ukraine that he was going to level Russia? <laughs> How's that working out so far, Senator Neil Khan? Level them. Level the place. 
Well, why not? They're just a bunch of Muslim terrorists in Palestine, right? <laughs> See, friends, look at these people here. You know what? They're Palestinians. They're Palestinians too. They kind of look like us, don't you think? Chapel veils, icons of Jesus, going to church. These are Christians living in Gaza. Now at the moment, with the backing of your country and mine, uh, they're evacuating their homes. They're gonna be homeless soon. Some of them, are gonna be dead later on today. Some of these people right here. You okay with that? Please, please, please. I know you've been watching your TV, those who are critics, and you're gonna come in here and you're gonna say that I'm trying to justify Hamas and that I'm anti-Semitic and, and I don't think that Israel has the right to defend itself. What's the matter with you, man? Right? You've been watching your TV, congratulations. Because the reality is, I'm not justifying anything Hamas did. And anyone who targets civilians needs to be punished. I get that. But is that what's going on here? Because we better, we better make darn sure that's what's going on before we get behind it. Before we start financing it. Before we stand before the judgment seat of Almighty God and say, Yeah, I was all for it, man. Level the place. Carpet bomb the cockroaches. This didn't start on October 7, 2003. You know, we think we got it bad right now because the Latin Mass is being canceled and woe is us, we have to go find a Mass somewhere further, we gotta drive further. Hmm. Here's what Christians in Gaza go through when they wanna go to Mass over in Jerusalem. And this has been going on for all my life, for years. This is exactly why there's been a mass exit in a, of Christians, an exodus of Christians from, from the Holy Land all my life. Palestinian Christians, once a powerful minority, are becoming the invisible people, squeezed between a growing Muslim majority and burgeoning Israeli settlements. Israel has occupied the West Bank for 45 years. If you see what's happening in the West Bank, uh, you will find that the West Bank is becoming more and more like a piece of a Swiss cheese where Israel gets the cheese, that is the land, the water resources, the archaeological sites, and the Palestinians are pushed in the holes behind the walls. But we're not supposed to pay any attention to that. As patriotic Americans, right, we're supposed to call for the carpet bombing of their homeland too now. We're supposed to get behind that. I tell my uh, brothers and sisters uh, from other nations, Christians, I tell them uh, to support us. My name is uh, Sandy Kumsiya. I'm a Christian Palestinian. We are here uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, it's really sad here. We want peace, of course we want peace, but we want a uh, balanced peace and fair peace. And the really weird thing about this, friends, if you dig into it just a little bit, where it gets really bizarre, Twilight Zone, Rod Serling is going to come walking in here, is when you realize that we're not, as Christians, we're not supposed to say one word in the defense of these people because, well, we need to get raptured. Many evangelicals believe that once Jews fully control the land, Jesus will return to earth and rapture Christians up to heaven. The title deed to the land of Israel is recorded in the Bible, which gives the Jewish people a clear and unclouded title to that land forever. It belongs to them and it belongs to them only. People that share this view are called Christian Zionists. They believe the Bible commands them to support and defend the modern day state of Israel, regardless of what this means for the Palestinians who live under its occupation. Now they're millions and millions of devout Christians who stand with Israel. So I want to thank you on behalf of all the people of Israel. Thank God not everybody agrees with the Christian Zionists. Thank God many, many Jews, some of whom are living in Israel, some of whom are Holocaust survivors, thank God those Jews are not being silent about what's really going on here. But I'm, a, I'm personally a Holocaust survivor. My, my, my grandparents were killed in Auschwitz. 
and uh, most of my extended family was killed. Um, that's my personal background. In my teenage years in Canada, I became a Zionist. This dream of the Jewish people resurrected in their historical homeland and the barbed wire of Auschwitz being replaced by the boundaries of a, of a Jewish state with a powerful army. I, I found it liberating. It was exhilarating to believe in that dream. And then I found out that it wasn't exactly like that. That in order to make this Jewish dream a reality, we had to visit a nightmare on the local population. And there's no way you could have ever created a, a Jewish state without uh, oppressing and ex expelling the local population, which is what they did. It's the longest ethnic cleansing operation in the 20th and 21st centuries. It's still going on. Given those conditions, of course people will go for extremist leadership. That's what people do when they're miserable and hopeless and deprived of any possibility whatsoever. You don't have to support Hamas policies to stand up for Palestinian rights. That's a complete falsity. Now, is it true that, that the Gazans shoot rockets into Israel, killing innocent civilians? Yes, it is. Do I support that? No, I don't. I just wish your Zionist friend would visit the occupied territories in Gaza like I have. And let him speak the way he speaks now. If he's got any ounce of humanity left, he would cry like I did for two weeks when I was there. It's always a complex question, but in terms of power and control, and it's pretty straightforward. There was a land with the people living there, and other people wanted it. They took it over, and they continue to take it over, and they continue to, do, to discriminate against, oppress, and dispossess that other people. That's what happened. And that's what's happening. And it just keeps going. In the wake of the Hamas attacks of October 7th, Israel cut off all food, supplies, medicine, water, electricity, and next to go will be the sewer systems. Now, even if every person in Gaza were a Muslim, is that okay? Are we okay with that? Is it okay for us to hate all Muslims because of what a few nutters did? To hate them all to that degree? Kill them all! Exterminate the cockroaches. Really? That's you? What is happening to us? Don't you understand? This is what the globalists do. It's what they, they spend every waking moment doing, trying to get us all to this point, get the whole world to this point. They're destabilizing the world by turning us all against each other. For what? Almost 2,000 years, Muslims, Christians, Jews lived in the Holy, Holy Land, mostly in peace. But then the globalists got involved, and it's been a bloodbath ever since. Gee, I wonder why. Even if you could kill every Muslim in Gaza, and I've heard people, man, Sean Hannity fans, that's basically what they sound like they want to do, kill every single Muslim in the area. Even if you could do that, you could kill every single one, which you can't, well, this U.S.-backed war crime is going to trigger every Muslim youth in the world, especially in America, to hate us for years to come. So those of you who are like, well, I'm siding with Israel because, man, those Muslims don't like us. Do you really think this is going to help? Carpet bombing their homeland again? Just like we did in Baghdad back in 2003, the Shakinah. That worked out pretty well, didn't it? Every Christian, Iraqi Christian now, lives up in Europe somewhere. Refugees blown out of their home because they were liberated by us. Liberated by the democracy people. <laughs> you think this is going to help? If you're afraid of Muslims, man, be careful supporting this U.S.-backed war crime in Israel, if in fact it happens. Speak up now. Let saner voices prevail here. Or we are going to have hell on earth for the next generation to deal with. Somebody, somewhere, should be suggesting we tap the brakes, don't you think? Like maybe, oh, I don't know, the Catholic Church. Wouldn't that be neat? <laughs> Where is the Catholic Church on what's going on over there, by the way?
It should be an issue, one would think, for Pope Francis, since Christians now are nearly gone. They're nearly, they've nearly disappeared completely from the Holy Land where Jesus Christ was born, died, and rose from the dead. Nearly completely gone. Again, another shining success story for the spirit of Vatican II. <laughs> Anybody see a little bit of apocalyptic happenings in the fact that there are no more Christians in the Holy Land? Because I sort of do. So I wonder, Francis, Pope Francis, you got any plan for that? You going to address that? Or are you just going to make sure that they keep their air conditioners off down there in Gaza before they get blown to hell so they can help with the ozone? But no, that's not going to happen because Pope Francis is, he's, he's pursuing the apostolate of the ear. Quisiera recordar que aquí no se acaba nada, sino que aquí continúa un camino eclesial. Se trata de un camino que recorremos como los discípulos de Maús, escuchando al Señor que siempre sale a nuestro encuentro. Es el Señor de la sorpresa. Por medio de la oración y el discernimiento, el Espíritu Santo nos ayuda a realizar el apostolado del oído. The apostolate of the ear, listening with God's ears. That's what he's doing. The God of surprises has a pair of ears, and Francis borrows them. <laughs> and who is he listening to this week? Yeah, Bob, another big story this week was the Pope's warm reception of Sister Janine Gramic. She is the co-founder of New Ways Ministry, which is a Catholic gay advocacy group. Um, and as many might recall, Sister Gramic was a close friend and promoter of the disgraced pedophile former priest Paul Shanley. Francis met with Gramic for nearly an hour, and New Ways Ministry has been previously sanctioned by both the Vatican and the USCCB and several bishops. Um, you know, Bob, the traditional Latin Mass is essentially verboten. There's no time to meet with Cardinal Joseph Zen. Faithful Chinese Catholics are an afterthought, but the Pope is an hour for Sister Gramic and company. But wait, there's more. Whoopee. I went to see Pope Francis. Yes. And that was kind of interesting. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so yeah. amazing. Like, holy <laughs> moly, <laughs> for real. He was quite amazing. He's, he is exactly what I hoped he would be, which is a pope for all people, regardless of religion. Now, let's be real clear about this, friends, OK? This is all scripted. This is all part of the synodal show. Like, I don't think any of this is happening by accident. Whoopi Goldberg approves of the Synod on Synodality, don't you see? She's back with the ladies on The View saying, oh, it's so great that Francis is going to welcome everybody back into the church no matter what they're doing with their lives because love is love. <laughs> Whoopi went to Catholic school, by the way. Okay, so she knows her stuff. In her book, The Choices We Made, Whoopi admits that she had seven abortions, that she's been married three times, that she's a rabid pro-abort, pro-gay marriage, leftist ideologue. Why don't we have her come over to the Vatican and visit the Pope? She represents the demographic that Francis is trying to attract. And don't forget now, she made headlines all over the world last year when she attacked <laughs> Archbishop Cordelion for refusing communion to whom? To Nancy Pelosi. And yet when she was in the Vatican with Francis, Look what he said to her while the cameras were rolling. I wanted to say thank you for everything. Yeah, very important. <laughs> Not as important as you. You are important. Oh no, you're more important than me. Yes, but you are important. That makes you sick. But you see what's going on here, right? It's all part of the pattern. It's all part of the game plan. First, Nancy Pelosi goes to the Vatican and receives communion at a papal mass, at the Pope's mass, after having been refused by the good Bishop of San Francisco. And now the good Bishop of San Francisco's most famous critic gets a private audience with Pope Francis. The abortion rights battle is starting to blur the lines between church and state. The Archbishop of San Francisco 
Mm. It's calling for Speaker Nancy Pelosi to be denied receiving communion because of her pro-choice stance. He's one of the priests who also called for President Biden to be denied sacrament. This is not your job, dude. <laughs> that is not, you can't, that is not up to you to make that decision. Whoopee! This is a synodal moment for everybody. And please, friends, please, just don't, don't tell me that the Pope not unlike our Lord, is merely meeting with the sinners and the tax collectors, <laughs> just like Jesus did. You can't possibly be that stupid. Nobody on the face of the earth is that naive to think that that's what's going on here. This was a high-profile audience with Whoopi. She wasn't just there to be chat chatted up by Francis, who was trying to convert her. No, somebody put a micro. Somebody at VaticanNews.com brought in the cameras and stuck a microphone in Whoopi's face and asked her to talk about what's happening in the world and in the church and a wonderful Francis. Is. You see, they wanted her insights. I don't remember Jesus eating with the prostitutes and a tax collector saying, T "Tell me what it's like to be a prostitute." Uh huh. Tell me what it's like to be a jerk, pat, tax collector. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can use some of this. Right? That never happened. Whoopi made the pages of the Pope's very own newspaper, L'Observatore Romano. Maybe Walter will scroll up and show you some of those pictures. Isn't that sweet? You see what you're looking at here? This is a synodal agenda. It's all part of the synodal agenda. And Whoopi Goldberg now, she did her part. And she stuck to the script and nailed her lines. And I wanted to thank him for all of my gay friends yeah. and for all of my divorce friends mm. yeah. because he basically has said, listen, God loves you no matter what, come back to the church. Yeah. I went to Catholic school and the, the first pope I ever knew about was called John the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Good and pope. he was instrumental in saying to the powers that be, listen, we cannot continue to do these masses in Latin, because not everybody speaks Latin. Do the mass in the language of the people we are giving the mass to, and tell these nuns to lighten up with these clothes. It's too, it's too heavy. This stupid synodal revolution is being waged by aging modernists who think, who actually think Whoopi Goldberg matters. You see, that's how old they are. You tell Whoopi Goldberg who, what, what happened, Gold what? To most young people, most of the world today, they don't know who she is, they don't care. Oh, that's right, that annoying lady on The View, okay. <laughs> they think she matters, and I rest my case on that. That's how out of touch they are. And with a stupid stunt like this, Francis is waking more people up than he's deceiving, and that's the good news. He is the quintessential modernist who maybe, I don't know, I doubt it, I don't think he's that gifted. But maybe in his younger days, uh, he was clever, now he's painfully obvious and pretty thick. Hay que cambiar. Pensamos cómo cambió desde el concilio hasta ahora y cómo tiene que seguir cambiando. Cambiando en la modalidad, cambiando en el modo de proponer una verdad que no cambia. O sea, la revelación de Jesucristo eso no cambia. El dogma de la Iglesia no cambia, pero crece, se desarrolla y se sublima como la savia de un árbol, ¿no? Se expresa mejor. El que no está en esta vía es uno que da un paso atrás y se encierra en sí mismo, ¿no? He actually thinks this is working. He's rolling out these clichés and these slogans and this nonsense from 50, 60 years ago. Even that lady who's interviewing him is going, ah, uh, what, what was that, holiness? <laughs> And how many forgotten little turds in history, forgotten little men have said the exact same stupid thing about how they were going to take Jesus Christ off the cross and destroy his church. <laughs> Francis, your revolution was denounced hundreds of years ago. It's nothing new. It was denounced, for example, a couple hundred years ago by a man named General Francois Charette the commander of the Catholic and Royal Army of the Vendée. And one morning, in order to help wake up his slumbering soldiers on the morning of a battle, Battle of Nantes in 1793, Francois Charette shouted 
his denunciation of the, of the revolutionary idea that Francis just trotted out as if it was something new. And Charette says, for us, our country is our villages, our altars, our graves, all that our fathers loved before us. Our country is our faith, our land, our king. But what is their country? It is as old as the devil. This world they call new and would establish in the absence of God, as old as the devil. They tell us we are slaves of ancient superstitions. How ridiculous. But in the face of these demons who are reborn from century to century, we are youth, gentlemen. We are the youth of God, the youth of faithfulness. And this youth intends to preserve for itself and for its sons, genuine humanity and the liberty of soul. How about you listen to that, Francis? You will never conquer us because we are youth, the youth of God, the youth of faithfulness, and we will preserve all that our fathers loved before us. <laughs> so gentlemen, to hell with synodality in all of its works and pomps, and from Francis of Rome, the modernist, libera nos, domine. <laughs>